Dead America, Seattle Part 1 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 3 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 23 Captain Kersey sat in a small back office at the tiny regional airport at midnight. He studied several maps of the Seattle area, multicolored marks flowing in various directions across them. The desk before him with the radio on it was buried in papers. He took a deep breath. The responsibility on his shoulders was heavy. Even though he was just a captain, and a newly promoted one at that, General Stevens, Adams, and the entirety of the presidential inner circle valued his on-the-ground experience so much that they'd given him command of barricade and diversion forces. To the outside observer, that wouldn't sound all that impressive. However, to those in the know, it showed great confidence in the captain. These three missions, the Northern Barricade, Mercer Island, and the Downtown Run, were all vital to the success of the mission. Kersey poured over the maps as the noises outside grew louder. More men moved in, machinery came in and out. The moment was upon them. The biggest single operation since the invasion of Normandy. Not only was this larger, it was arguably more important. That had been a battle for freedom, but this was for the survival of the nation, and possibly the human race. As he contemplated, brow furrowed, the radio sprung to life. Captain Kersey, do you copy? Stevens' voice came through. Kersey picked up the receiver and stood up from the maps, refocusing his attention. Yes, General? What's your status? Stevens asked. The Northern Blockade team is gearing up, he replied. They'll be airborne in fifteen. As soon as the planes return, they'll refuel and the Mercer Island squad will take off. Good, the general came back. And the interstate team for downtown? Kersey leaned on his hand. Last I heard, Corporal Bretz and his team were securing the trucks and awaiting dawn, he said. With where they're going, they'll need the daylight. Understood, Stevens replied. I appreciate the work you're doing for us. The captain nodded. It's my job, General, he said. And to be frank, you put your faith in me, and I want to make sure you never think it was misplaced. I appreciate that as well, Stevens replied. I'll never complain about being made to look good. They chuckled together, and then he continued. I do have one additional task for you, Captain. Of course, sir, Kersey said. As you know, ammunition is at a premium, the general began. So in addition to the clear teams that will be trailing behind the main force, I need you to set aside some scroungers. They will need to look in every business that would carry guns and ammo, and even homes if they have time. The captain nodded. Yes, sir, I will make it happen. I know you will, Stevens replied confidently. Kersey took a deep breath. Sir, if there is nothing else, he said slowly, I need to brief Sergeant Copeland and his team before they head off. Of course, Captain, the general replied. I look forward to your updates. The line went dead and Kersey took a beat before setting the receiver down and glancing at his watch. It was just past midnight. Okay, he said to himself, straightening his shoulders. Game time. He picked up a few of the maps of the northern area, the town of Burlington. It was a sleepy little villa just across the river from Mount Vernon and if things went well, it would be a perfect choke point for the hundreds of thousands of zombies looming in the north. He walked out of the room, maps tucked under his arm and onto the airfield. There were six small planes lined up on the runway, pilots standing outside of them and biding their time. He made his way to the hangar at the far end of the field, currently bathed in light, both artificial and from barrel fires to keep the men warm. As he stepped in, Sergeant Copeland approached him immediately. Captain Kersey, he said politely, dark skin glimmering in the firelight. Sergeant, Kersey replied with a nod. You boys about ready to go? he asked, glancing past the burly bold sergeant at the thirty-four other men prepping their gear for the assault. He pursed his lips, a look of concern crossing his face. Looks like you're a little light on men there, he said. Copeland sighed. Yeah, Tell me about it, he agreed. Two of the planes conked out, so unless someone wanted to hang on to the wings, we weren't getting them there. No volunteers, I take it? Kersey asked with a lopsided smile. Copeland chuckled. No, sir, he replied. 
although I'm pretty sure I could get Kowalski to do it on a dare. Private Kowalski looked up from his pack. I heard my name, he barked. Whatever it is, I swear I didn't do it. Must not be talking about any hot women, then, Private Wade quipped from beside him, grinning ear to ear. Kowalski put a hand to his chest in mock offense. What the hell, man? he demanded playfully. I thought a sniper stuck together. If that were true, you wouldn't have cranked up the yacht rock the other day. Wade shot back, pointing a finger at his friend. Kowalski smirked. Eh, valid point. Private Johnson began muttering obscenities behind them as he tried to strap on his parachute. Kersey and Copeland chuckled and shook their heads before the latter snapped his fingers at one of the other men. Corporal Dawson, he called. Yes, sir. Dawson's short and stocky frame snapped to attention. Copeland motioned to the struggling private. Can you please help Johnson there before he pulls something? he asked. Dawson laughed and turned to help the wild redneck, who was still grunting and huffing in frustration even as he lowered his arms to accept the help. Kersey handed the maps out to Copeland, and the sergeant flipped through them quickly. They were printed maps this time instead of hand-drawn, with multiple locations circled throughout. Not bad quality, Copeland said. Kersey wrinkled his nose. Printer ran out of Cyan before they all came out, so some of your boys will have to share, he said. First world problems, Captain, Copeland replied with a chuckle, shaking his head. First world problems. He took one of the maps and then handed the stack to Private Mac, who began distributing them amongst the men. All right, boys, Copeland barked. Let's settle down. We got a busy-ass morning ahead of us, so we need to go over the game plan. There was a shuffle as the men settled in, turning towards their sergeant and holding their maps. A few bending over shared papers. Kersey stepped off to the side to watch the briefing. Our primary goal this morning is to block off the I-5 bridge over the river, Copeland began. The bad news is, it's a four-lane road with thousands of zombies to the north and south of it. The good news is, the tools we need to block it off are already there in the form of concrete median barriers. Only thing we need is to go find a way to move them. Our secondary goal is to block off the town bridge to the east. Luckily, this is only a two-lane bridge, and the expected enemy push is going to be minimal compared to the interstate area. So a few trucks ought to do the trick. He held up the map, pointing to the north. There are going to be three teams working together to make this happen. Kowalski, Wade, he said, pointing to the two snipers. They perked up, sitting at attention as their names were called. Your sniper teams are going to be landing to the northwest of the river, the sergeant explained. Assuming you hit your landing target, you'll be half a mile from your position. He pointed to a large shopping center between the interstate and the surface road leading to the other bridge. You're going to be set up here, in two teams, one facing each road. Your mission is to draw as many of those things to you as possible, giving the bridge team time to set up the barricade. When you hit the ground, you start lighting them up, because we're going to need them away from the bridge if we're going to be able to do our job. Kowalski's brow furrowed as he studied the map closely, focusing in on a dark section of the interstate. Question, Sarge? he said, raising his hand. What is it, Private? Copeland asked. The sniper pointed to the blob. Any idea what this dark patch on the interstate is? he asked. We're hoping it's just darker pavement, the sergeant admitted, shaking his head. The snipers shared a concerned look. Hoping? Kowalski demanded. Copeland held up a palm. Relax, Private. You boys are good at what you do, he said confidently. You'll find a way to get across. Kowalski and Wade preened with some pride at the praise, even though both knew it was a blatant dismissal of their concern. Corporal Dawson, Copeland continued, your team is up next. While the population to the north in Burlington is about 10,000, the population to the south in Mount Vernon is closer to 35,000 and it being mostly residential near the bridge, the sniper diversion teams wouldn't be nearly as effective. He grinned. So we're gonna have to get a little more creative. He held up the map, motioning at the landing zone to the southeast of the river, and the group all looked over their papers. There was a long line drawn down a highway running diagonally to the interstate, with a large circle just to the west of the road. You'll be landing with us to the southeast of the river, Copeland continued. Then huffing it. It's a three-mile hike through infested territory, but there's no other safe landing zone that's closer. 
Dawson nodded. We'll make do, Sarge, he assured his superior. Just let us know what needs to be done. Good, because you got the most important mission of the day, Copeland declared. Your target is a car dealership. You have a few mechanics on your team who are going to set the car alarm sensitivity to maximum, which means a stiff breeze will set it off. The rest of you will be spreading the cars out around town, hopefully attracting those things who will keep the cycle going by bumping into them. This won't be perfect, but hopefully it will keep the pressure off of my team on the bridges. He took a deep breath, looking around at the men who were nodding and staring down at the maps, murmuring quietly to each other. Copeland looked to his squad. You boys are going to be with me, he said. Our first target is the supercenter just south of the bridge. According to the sat image, there are a few trucks parked in the back, which we'll use for the side bridge. For the main bridge, we'll need to secure some rebar or other pole from the store so we can move those barriers. We got a buttload of them to do, so if you see back braces in the store, grab some. A light round of chuckles rippled across the men. Okay, Copeland continued, clapping his hands together. Let's talk loadout. South teams, you got 210 rounds for your primary, 30 for your side. Sniper team, you've been authorized for double at 420. We're going to be relying on you to hold the northern front one shot at a time. Kowalski raised a victory fist. Don't worry, Sarge, he piped up. We're a competitive bunch, so you can be sure we'll be making every shot count. Double check your rations, Copeland reminded them. And make sure you have a three-day supply, because we could be there for a while before reinforcements arrive. If you need a top off, they're handing stuff out in the next hangar. Wade raised his hand, and the sergeant pointed to him. Who do we talk to about night vision scopes? The private asked. Copeland glanced over at Kersey, and the captain took a step forward. I was able to score a handful of them, enough for the sniper squad and one each for the others, he replied. They'll be waiting for you at the planes. The sergeant nodded and then spread his arms, looking around expectantly. Anybody else got questions? he asked. There was a moment of silence, and a few replies in the negative came from some of the men. Good, Copeland declared and rolled a hand over his head. Get loaded up. We're in the air in five. Chapter Two Kowalski, Wade, and six other snipers packed tightly into a small aircraft. There was barely room to move between the men and the gear, all squeezed in like a sardine can. Kowalski looked out over the darkness, catching the occasional glimpse of a building in the rural areas as the moonlight caught windows. Hey, man, when was the last time you made a jump? Wade asked, nudging his arm. Kowalski tilted his head back and forth, unable to move enough to shrug. I don't know, a year, maybe a year and a half, he said. What about you? About a week before all this began, Wade replied. Kowalski blinked at him. A week? he asked. Where the hell were you? This little vacation spot in Colorado, his companion replied. Kowalski raised an eyebrow at the tattooed sniper in disbelief. You... you jump for fun? Hell yeah, I do, Wade replied, excitement in his eyes. Try to do fifteen to twenty jumps a year if I can. It's more of a rush than being in a mosh pit. His companion shook his head. Dude, this is going to be the first time I've jumped out of a plane without being paid to do so, he admitted. At least I'm assuming we're not getting paid anymore. You're missing out, man, Wade said. When we survive this, I'm going to talk to the higher-ups about setting up a jump school. Kowalski rolled his eyes. Uh-huh, okay. Well, if you need somebody to help teach those people how to shoot once they land, give me a shout. Wade grinned and snaked a hand up to give him a thumbs up. Kowalski simply shook his head and leaned back, tapping the pilot on the shoulder. How far out are we from the jump? he asked. The pilot flicked on a small book light and checked his map and then looked over his instruments. We'll be over the zone in two minutes, he replied. Kowalski patted his shoulder at an awkward angle and then pulled his arm back down to his side. Okay, listen up, he declared, getting everyone's attention. We're two minutes out. It's going to be a low drop, so don't wait too long on pulling your chute. You all know the landing zone. We rendezvous at a small house on the east side of the field. Questions? When nobody said anything, he nodded firmly. Then let's get ready. 
He shuffled over to the door and waited by it, checking his equipment one last time as the throttle to the engine dialed back to reduce the speed. When the pilot held up his hand, giving the sniper a thumbs up, Kowalski threw open the door and began ushering his men out of the plane. Right after Wade jumped, Kowalski waved to the pilot and then leapt out into the air himself. The wind rushed by his face as he hurtled towards the ground. His heart raced, blood pumping as fear and adrenaline coursed through him. Kowalski was not a fan of flying through the air. When he finally pulled the ripcord on his chute, it opened without a hitch, and he finally allowed his body to relax a little. He looked around at the rest of his squad gracefully floating to the ground. He looked down, checking the field within sight, only a minute or so away. From his vantage point, he could also look over the interstate and bridge, and their target shopping center. Holy fuck, he breathed, heart rate tripling at the amount of movement on the road and parking lot outside of the shopping center. Guess that wasn't just dark pavement, he muttered, and then braced himself for his landing. He hit the ground hard, stumbling forward and falling onto his hands and knees. Wade approached, chuckling, and helped him back up as he unclipped his chute. Need to work on that landing there, bud, Wade teased. Kowalski grumbled. Or I could just not jump anymore, he replied. Wade continued to chuckle as they headed off towards the rally point a few hundred yards away. You catch the movement on the road? he finally asked, sobering. Yep. Kowalski replied, voice level. Gonna be a bitch to get around that. His companion clapped him on the shoulder. Well, good thing they sent the best of the best. Or the best that they could find, Kowalski shot back with a smirk. Wade rolled his eyes. Thanks for the morale boost there, bud. Any time, Kowalski replied brightly. They reached the farmhouse, a tiny run-down shack with a beat-up pickup truck in front of it. Privates Martin and Doyle came around from the other side, walking casually. Perimeter is clear, Doyle reported as they approached. Martin shook his head. Can't say the same about the road. No shit, Wade agreed. I've seen major festivals that were less crowded. Where are the other four at? Kowalski asked. Doyle jerked a thumb over his shoulder. We send them up ahead to scout the shopping center on this side of the interstate and the road. All right. Kowalski replied. Let's go catch up with them and see what we're dealing with. The quartet hiked across the field, nothing but empty, overgrown grass ahead of them. They were silent as they walked, the daunting task ahead weighing heavy on their shoulders. As they reached the end of the field, the four other snipers crouched near a giant tree, one of them scouting out the shopping center through his scope. What you got? Kowalski asked. The sniper lowered his weapon and shook his head. Face palm in the moonlight. Nothing good. Kowalski and Wade both took a knee, pulling out their rifles to survey the situation. About two hundred yards from their current position was the mid-sized shopping center with several outbuildings on the far end of the lot, close to the interstate. Past that was the interstate itself, and their main target across from that. Both men's breath hitched at the hundreds of zombies in the lot, like a Black Friday sale gone crazy. The interstate was no better, jam-packed with ghouls. The two men put down their rifles before pulling the group together. Obviously, the direct approach isn't going to work, Kowalski finally said, swallowing hard. From what I could tell on the glide-in, this group stretches up the road quite a ways. Martin nodded. Yeah, it would take too long to try and circle around them. We need to draw them away from the road, create an opening we can slip through. Wade suggested. Doyle shook his head. Not gonna do much unless we pull some to the north, too. Kowalski raised his gun again, looking through the scope to do a rough count of zombies, his mouth going dry when he realized it was in the thousands. He pushed down the anxiety and focused in on the shopping center, seeing a pathway to the back of the anchor store that was mostly clear. Hey, take a look at the center building there, he said, nudging Wade. His companion complied, seeing a pathway through the field to the back of the store. What am I looking at? he asked. You think you can get to that ladder on the back? Kowalski asked. Wade studied the ladder in question, a metal structure with a protective cover that stretched eight feet up before the rungs were exposed. He scoped out the back of the store, seeing a dumpster about fifteen yards away, 
but also a half a dozen zombies in the immediate vicinity, with dozens more on either side of the far ends of the building. Ain't gonna be fun, he admitted, but I think I can pull it off. He lowered his gun and turned to his companion. Kowalski nodded. Good, he said. That's what I want you to do then. Get up on top and start causing a ruckus. What about the northern position? Martin asked. Kowalski pointed to two of the kneeling men. I want you two to handle that. Private Hurley spoke up from beside them. That's gonna leave us mighty thin for the main target, he declared, especially when we have two fronts to cover. True, Kowalski agreed. But if we try to cross that sea of death without diversions, we're gonna be a whole lot thinner. Hurley nodded in defeat. Heard that, he agreed. How far up do you want us? One of the snipers asked, getting to his feet. Kowalski contemplated for a few moments, looking at the interstate and picking the crossing point. There was a spot about two hundred yards up from the edge of the parking lot, a short climb up a hill that led to the freeway. Two blocks, he said. Find whatever structure you can get on top of and start firing. What's your ETA? Wade asked them as they nodded. Don't want to start firing too early. One of the snipers shrugged. If we're not firing consistently within ten minutes, he replied, there's a good chance the shots you do hear will be our last. Ten minutes it is, then, Wade replied, clapping him on the shoulder. Kowalski looked around at the group. Okay, we good? he asked. And when there was no response, he raised a fist. All right, let's move. The two snipers headed off towards the north, and Wade tore off for the shopping center. He stayed low as he moved across the field, the moonlight wasn't exceptionally bright, and while that was difficult for him to see where he was going, it provided him some cover at least. After a bit, he reached the end of the field, taking a knee in the grass to get a look at the situation. The ladder was forty yards directly in front of him, with half a dozen zombies shambling about. To the left, fifteen ghouls hung out by a door about forty yards away, and to the right was the dumpster with about ten more monsters twenty yards past it. Gonna have to go silent, Wade thought to himself, at least initially. He pulled out a knife and unlatched the holster on his handgun, just in case. He focused in on the closest zombie that was directly in front of the ladder. He darted out from cover, using the soft ground to muffle his footsteps as he quickly closed the gap. He slowed to a cautious pace as soon as he hit the pavement. The first zombie had its back to him, making the kill easy. He shoved the blade into the base of its skull, catching the creature as it fell. He gently laid it on the ground to the left of the ladder. The other creatures milled about aimlessly, not alerted to his presence just yet. He turned his attention to the duo behind him and the dumpster. They were close together, about three yards apart, looking away from him. He silently moved up, but his toe kicked a rock that skittered across the asphalt. Shit, he thought, freezing. The two closest zombies heard and turned around, immediately opening their mouths to moan. Answering moans erupted from behind him as well. Fuck it, Wade muttered, and sheathed his knife, pulling his handgun. He popped off two quick rounds into the zombies by the dumpster. This set off a chorus of moans in both directions, so he rushed to the bin and threw his weight into it. It picked up speed, and he rammed it into a trio of ghouls headed his way. The front edge of the dumpster popped up in the air as it rolled over a rotted corpse. He pushed as hard as he could to make sure the back end cleared the obstruction. The bin cleared the body, and he gave the metal beast a shove, stopping dead in his tracks to pop a bullet into the speed bump's head. He looked over at the two other zombies that had been knocked down, struggling to get to their feet. He aimed for a second, but then quickly changed course, running towards the dumpster and pushing it against the wall by the ladder. As the zombies closed the gap, Wade jumped up onto the bin, making sure to put the bulk of his weight onto the frame rather than the dumpster lid. With all the extra ammo and food weighing him down, he didn't want to risk crashing through the doors. He stood up on the edge and watched the horde of creatures headed his way in both directions. He worked his way carefully around the outer edge of the bin before leaping up and grabbing onto the first exposed rung. He strained as he pulled himself up, using his upper body exclusively until he was able to swing his feet up onto the ladder. Wade paused for a moment to catch his breath, locking his knee and looking below. Dozens of zombies clustered below, reaching up and moaning. 
He shook his head and took a deep breath, getting back to his task and climbing the rest of the way up to the roof. As he hopped over the side, he dropped his heavy bag as he walked to the front of the building, carrying only his rifle. The sight below took his breath away. There's something you don't see every day, Wade muttered, and shook his head in disbelief as he gazed at hundreds of zombies. They were easily into the thousands on the interstate, just a sea of rotting flesh, none the wiser to his presence. He took in the sight for a few tense moments before remembering to breathe and readying his rifle. He picked out his first target looking through the night vision scope, seeing muted tones instead of a bright and vibrant color. The first head that exploded could have been a watermelon, and nobody would have been able to tell due to the lack of color. The gunshot echoed across the area, and within seconds the moaning increased exponentially. It was so loud that Wade paused, blinking into the darkness. Damn, looks like that got their attention, he muttered, and stared out at the death ocean for another moment before taking aim and firing again, hitting another monster in the head. The zombies in the parking lot all began to move towards the anchor store he stood atop, and a small trickle of creatures began to filter in from the interstate. He checked his watch, seeing it had been seven minutes since the other snipers had given him the ten-minute timeline. Okay, boys, he said under his breath. You got three minutes to start firing. I know I can pull mine off. Chapter 3 on the ground, Kowalski led his squad of five into position to take advantage of the hole on the interstate. There was a fast food place just across the field and directly in front of the crossing spot. A trio of zombies roamed around the back, uninterested in the noise a block over that Wade was causing. Kowalski pulled out his knife, prompting Doyle and Martin to do the same. He inclined his head towards the ghouls and they broke off in unison each soldier jamming a blade into a zombie skull. The group of five pressed up against the wall of the restaurant, keeping watch on their flanks as Kowalski crept up to the corner. He looked towards the interstate, seeing the path was still thick, even though a few groups were working their way towards Wade. "'How's it looking?' Doyle murmured from behind him. Kowalski shook his head and whispered, "'Still too thick to pass.' "'Why isn't Wade shooting?' Doyle asked. Kowalski looked at his watch. Probably still waiting on the northern group, he replied quietly. Still got two minutes. Martin stayed on the other flank, keeping watch. Three zombies came towards them, mouths opening with hungry moans. He clucked his tongue to get the attention of his team. Doyle and Private Carver turned to deal with the threat, taking out the zombies as more moans erupted from the side of the restaurant. The former peeked around and saw a dozen creatures near the front of the store, looking around for the source of the noise that had dissipated. He crept back to Kowalski. We can't stay here much longer, he murmured. His superior nodded and checked his watch again, seeing it tick down to one minute. Come on, come on, he urged quietly. A few tense seconds later, gunfire erupted to the north, Martin looked around the corner and saw the zombies near the front had lost interest in their skirmish and shambled off towards the new noises. Wade opened fire right after giving the zombies two different sounds to hone in on. Kowalski looked around his corner and watched the creatures breaking up, heading in one direction or the other. After a minute of sustained fire in both directions, a pathway across the interstate began to open up. However, several dozen zombies remained in the way, ping-ponging back and forth with every gunshot that went off. Okay, we gotta move, he hissed. Doyle peeked past him at the zombies still in the way. What about them? he asked. Plow through them and get across, Kowalski replied. Our target is the giant hardware store at the south end of the center. We're going around the back for roof access. Doyle nodded and moved to the back of the line, letting the others know they were ready to go. Kowalski gave one more look to get his bearings, and then broke from cover, the rest of his team hot on his heels. He moved away from the wall and into the center of the drive through aisle to prevent any surprises around the corner. They broke out into the open, running across the parking lot as hard as they could. By the time they reached the frontage road, their footsteps had gained the attention of several indecisive zombies. Rather than attack, Kowalski dodged the first few before lowering his shoulder into the next one, sending it to the side. 
He was the first to reach the grass and quickly climbed the short incline, about ten feet, with the rest of the group behind. He glanced back, seeing the others as well as a few dozen zombies within twenty yards shuffling towards them. He turned back to the interstate, coming over the crest of the hill and hitting the pavement. There were about forty zombies spread out between them and the opposite side. As he paused briefly to plot their course, one creature about fifteen yards away turned to moan at him, but then its head exploded. Kowalski cracked a smile as the rest of the group caught up to him. Straight across, we got cover, he said. They took off like a shot, running in a straight line as Wade fired at a pretty decent clip. One by one, the creatures in front of them fell, clearing a path. When they reached the median, Kowalski hopped over the concrete barrier first. As he did, several zombies converged on his position, having been unable to clear the barrier to get to the gunfire noise. Move it! Kowalski yelled. The hold is closing! Doyle, Martin, and Hurley cleared the barrier, the latter barely making it past the outstretched arms. Carver, a few yards behind, hesitated, seeing the window closing. He pulled out his handgun and took aim, firing and hitting one creature in the head. Another zombie on the line fell in a spray of blood and bone from Wade's bullet. Kowalski skidded to a stop and looked back. Move it, Carver! he screamed, panic rising at his teammate's situation. Doyle and Martin turned and squeezed off a few shots with their handguns, trying to thin the growing herd around their friend. Fuck it, Carver said, and ran towards the barrier planting a foot on the median and leaping forward with everything he had. One zombie managed to catch his ankle, stopping his forward momentum and dropping him to the ground. Before he could even register the pain of his face meeting the pavement, a dozen creatures dove at him, tearing into him with claws and teeth. As his screams pierced the air, Kowalski grabbed Doyle by the arm. He's gone! We gotta move! he cried, and shoved him away from the carnage. The quartet slid down the hill on their side of the interstate, getting to the frontage road with handguns drawn. There were a few zombies on the road, with more coming from the side streets and business parking lots, attracted to the gunfire and Carver's dying screams. Kowalski stepped through the group, leading them towards the shopping centre a few hundred yards away at a brisk pace. "'Only fire if you have to. We gotta shed some of this heat,' he said. His companions looked lost, ashen-faced and unsure of themselves. Kowalski snapped his fingers, making them look at him. Carver's gone, he said, tone harsh. We'll have to deal with it on the roof. Now let's move, he demanded. The snipers nodded and followed him as he ran towards a side street, making the turn towards the shopping centre on the right. Dozens of zombies littered the side street, pouring out from the parking lot. Kowalski picked up his pace into high gear the others following suit. They attempted to make it to the truck entrance of the shopping centre, but a throng of zombies flooded out of it, drawn to the noise. He tore off of the street into an overgrown field, trying to cut off the horde. Halfway across, a hand grabbed his ankle, and he instinctively fired down into a zombie's head, just an inch away from his foot. He stared down at it for a moment, stunned at the close call. Doyle caught up to him and looked down at the corpse, missing its bottom half, and shook his head. Way too close for comfort, bud, he breathed. Kowalski nodded in agreement and then took a deep breath, continuing their trek. He looked to his left, seeing the zombies from the truck entrance were heading their way now, drawn to his gunshot, entering the grass. Gotta get to solid ground, he huffed, and tore towards the pavement behind the stores relieved to be out of the tall grass where the undead could be lurking. He glanced to the left, seeing dozens of creatures moving towards them, but still far enough away that they weren't yet a threat. To the right was mostly clear. "'Should be a couple hundred yards to the store,' he said, and took off running. His trio of companions followed him, guns raised and ready for action. As they approached the edge of the building next to a short driveway, they stopped at the sight of a hundred ghouls packed into the area, the back end fifteen yards from their corner. Shit, that's a lot of those things, Kowalski muttered under his breath. Doyle looked over and saw the ladder on the back of the store, the same kind as the one Wade had used with the cover over the bottom eight feet of rungs. Unfortunately for them, there was no dumpster in sight. Well, there's our target, Doyle said, 
but we're going to need teamwork to get up there. Kowalski peeked out again, but a zombie caught sight of the movement and moaned, shambling their way. Good enough for me. Let's move, he urged, and the quartet sprinted across the driveway. As they raced down the back of the store towards the ladder, moaning erupted in front of them. I'll cover the front, Kowalski barked. Start getting up there. He stopped just past the ladder, pulling up his rifle and finding the target about thirty yards ahead with his night vision scope. He fired off several shots in rapid succession, buying them some time. Meanwhile, Doyle crouched and laced his fingers together, giving Martin a boost up to the rung cover. After he was clear, he boosted Hurley up. Kowalski, let's go, Doyle cried, and his team leader fired one more shot before tearing back to him, practically flying up to the ladder. Kowalski hooked an arm through the ladder rung and looked down at Doyle. Grab my leg and climb up, he called. Doyle took a few steps back before running hard towards the ladder. He put a foot on the wall and launched himself up, grabbing onto Kowalski's leg. The sniper grunted at the extra weight, but it didn't take long for Doyle to secure himself and pull his weight from Kowalski's body. Free advice, Kowalski grunted. Lay off the corpse. Doyle chuckled and shook his head as they climbed up to join the others on the roof. The duo took a moment to breathe deep looking down at the creatures all reaching up to them from the ground. They exchanged a fist bump and then walked to the front of the store to join Martin and Hurley, dropping their bags and gear. The quartet froze as they looked out over the sea of creatures in the parking lot, spreading back to the smaller bridge and road. "'What do you say we give them a reason to head our way, huh?' Kowalski asked. The other men nodded and readied their rifles. Soon the air was filled with high-powered rifle shots booming off at a consistent pace. Kowalski took a deep breath and pulled out his walkie-talkie. Sarge, it's Kowalski. We're in position, he said into the radio. Chapter 4 Sergeant Copeland reined in his parachute as he looked around the field. Several men had formed a perimeter, keeping watch for the ghouls, while the rest of the men secured their gear. After a few moments, Corporal Dawson handed over to him. "'Your team good to go?' Copeland asked. Dawson nodded. "'Yes, sir. Fifteen of us ready to go,' he replied. "'Okay. Be safe. We'll see you on the bridge after a while,' Copeland replied. The two long-time friends exchanged a fist bump before Dawson headed off to join his group. A few moments later, Johnson approached, flanked by a group of ten soldiers. "'Sarge!' We're landed and ready to roll. Good man, Copeland replied, nodding. So listen up, everybody, he began, turning to the group. We're going to be moving quick. We got a mile and a half to cover, and you need to be there an hour ago. Unless you see me take a shot, nobody is to even draw their weapons. Is that understood? There was a chorus of, yes, sir, and he nodded again. One shot could give us away and undermine what our boys to the north and south are doing for us he continued. When we get to the supercenter, Johnson, Raymond, and Schmidt, you work your way to the loading docks and inspect those trucks. If they're not good to go, then we need to come up with a plan B. The rest of you will fan out in the store, clearing it of any hostiles and securing metal posts so we can build that barricade. If you see anything else that might be useful, make a note of it and we'll come back once our primary mission is complete. He crossed his arms. Questions? There was a chorus in the negative this time, and he raised a hand. Then let's move them out! He led the group off of the field and onto the street that ran parallel to the river. They moved faster than an average jogging speed, their footsteps echoing in the darkness. As they moved, several zombies reacted to the noise, emerging from the neighborhood to the south. Copeland barely batted an eye at the emerging threat, instead picking up the pace to stay clear of them. As they reached the few blocks before the surface street bridge, he stopped the group at a crossroads. Several moans erupted from the south of them, about thirty yards down the side street. Copeland glanced over, seeing it was about five zombies. He snapped his fingers and pointed, and five soldiers broke formation, pulling out knives and rushing the ghouls to take them out silently. Copeland focused back on the bridge as they returned to formation, leaving a pile of bodies in their wake. Johnson, the sergeant said. The private approached. Sarge, I need your night scope. 
Copeland said. Johnson handed over his rifle with the night vision scope, and the sergeant looked through it to study the large congregation of zombies on the bridge that stretched almost to the road they were on. He let out a low grunt and handed the rifle back. Detour, Copeland said. Let's move. He led the group down a block before turning back to the west towards the target. They reached the bridge road, and Copeland checked out the horde of zombies beginning about sixty yards up. He motioned for them to keep moving, but put a finger to his lips. They crept across the road, keeping their footsteps as light as possible. When they reached the other side and moved behind cover, they picked up the pace again, continuing to ignore creatures stumbling out from the shadows. After several minutes, they finally reached the edge of the parking lot to the supercenter. There were a few zombies near the corner of the lot that Copeland pointed to. The same soldiers that dispatched the earlier ones repeated their stealthy kills, ending the nearby threat. The sergeant took a knee, and the rest of the squad followed. He held out his hand, and Johnson gave him the night vision scope again. The lot was dotted with abandoned vehicles, as well as a couple dozen creatures wandering about. Copeland looked up towards the bridge, seeing a mass of monsters on it. As he looked, the first shots from the northern group rang out, and some of the zombies turned to shamble in that direction. "'Those sniper boys don't waste time, do they?' Johnson murmured from behind him. Copeland grunted, knowing that the noise was going to quickly bring undead reinforcements from the south. "'You all know what to do,' he said. "'Let's move.' The sergeant led the group across the parking lot, spreading out as they went. As they approached the front of the building, various soldiers delivered knife blows to creatures they encountered, clearing the way for them. Copeland was the first to the front door, approaching it cautiously in case of undead company. He stood in front of it, motioning for Johnson to throw it open so he could breach. As soon as the private opened the door, Copeland rushed inside, delivering a vicious kick to the torso of a zombie, sending it flying across the entryway. He whipped around and jammed his blade into an eye socket of another, and Johnson swept past him to stab the one that was on the ground. "'Trucks, go!' Copeland hissed. Johnson, Raymond, and Schmidt rushed off down the side aisle of the store, pulling out flashlights to illuminate their path. As they reached the back of the store, they spotted five zombies standing in front of the loading dock door. Johnson held the trio up while putting his flashlight down to avoid the creatures coming their way. He glanced over, checking to see they were in sporting goods. He stepped into the aisle and grabbed an aluminum baseball bat, motioning for the other two to do the same. Once properly armed, they rushed down the back aisle towards the creatures. Johnson delivered an overhead smash to the lead zombie, crumpling it, and held up the flashlight so the other two could swing away. After several batter-ups, the threat was eliminated. Johnson motioned for them to follow him into the loading dock. He peeked through the small window in the swinging doors, seeing nothing close to it. They moved through and put up their flashlights, illuminating the entire area. There were three zombies at the far end, but nothing else in the sprawling area. You two, take them out, Johnson instructed. I'll secure the back door. The two soldiers walked down to bash some skulls while Johnson headed to his destination. He removed the bolt lock and gently opened the door a crack, listening for noise. When he didn't hear anything, he pushed its side open, seeing the back area clear. There were three transfer trucks backed up to the loading bays. Something brushed up against his arm and he startled, whipping around, bat raised. Raymond and Schmidt backed up, hands out. Jesus, jump rope in Christ, don't do that! Johnson hissed, his heart rate tripled. The two men chuckled under their breaths, muttering, sorry, in unison. He let out a deep whoosh of breath and motion for them to follow him. Come on, check the trucks, he said. Make sure the battery is good. Each of the trio picked a truck, making sure that nothing was waiting for them beneath the vehicles. Johnson swept the area and then clambered up into his, turning the key and relieved to see the dash lights come on. He checked the gas meter and saw it was a half full. That should be good enough to get us four blocks, he said quietly, and then turned the ignition off and slipped out of the truck. My truck is good, Raymond reported as he approached. Battery works and full tank of gas. Schmidt shook his head. Looks like I got gas, but the battery wouldn't cooperate. Two out of three ain't bad, Johnson replied with a shrug. Come on, let's go find the Sarge. The trio headed back into the main part of the store. 
There were footsteps, moans, and the sound of bodies hitting the floor echoing throughout the building. After a few moments, there was sporadic bellows of, Clear! and then quiet. Sarge, what's your twenty? Johnson called, cupping a hand around his mouth. Copeland's voice echoed in the store. Aisle fifteen, he replied. The trio made their way over to the sergeant who was watching the soldiers running around the store. Some of them carried equipment to the front of the store to stage it, while a few others came up with various items of food and weaponry. Copeland gave a yay or nay to different items depending on need. Johnson, what you got? he asked, as he gave a thumbs up to a case of tire irons. The private jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Three trucks in the back, he replied. Two are good to go, one needs a jump. Outstanding, Copeland said, nodding. While we're getting prepped here, you hit automotive and see if they have one of those emergency battery chargers. Hook it up, leave it running, then get back here. As soon as Dawson starts pulling some of those things to the south, we're hitting the bridge. Johnson saluted him. You got it, Sarge, he replied, and then headed off to automotive with Schmidt and Raymond in tow. As they disappeared around the aisle, Copeland's walkie-talkie vibrated. He picked it up and clicked it on. Sarge, it's Kowalski, the sniper came through. We're in position. Copeland nodded. Good news, he replied. But I heard some gunfire earlier than expected. Ah, let's just say the interstate wasn't dark, Kowalski replied sheepishly. Had to divert from the plan in order to get across. The sergeant stiffened. Situation, he asked. Three on the west side of the interstate, four at the designated target, the sniper reported. Copeland sighed. Those numbers didn't add up. Who didn't make it? Carver, Kowalski replied, voice thick. The sergeant shook his head, taking a moment to process. You don't lose anybody else, he finally said, firmly. That's an order. Yes, sir, the sniper replied. Copeland took a deep breath. We're at the supercenter, gonna be ready to move as soon as Dawson gets to work. In the meantime, we'll pull them our way, Kowalski assured him. Heard, the sergeant replied. Copeland out. He put the radio away, crossing his arms as he watched his soldiers work. Come on, Dawson, get it done. Chapter 5 Corporal Dawson watched on as several members of his fifteen-strong team stabbed and bashed in the skulls of a dozen zombies that had wandered out from a side street. It was the last one before the interstate, but the fourth major confrontation his squad had faced on the three-mile trek to the car dealership. This worried him, because if they were encountering so much resistance on the residential streets, it not only made their job more difficult, but it made him wonder how bad the situation at the bridge was. After the cleansing finished up, Privates Mack and Moss jogged back from the top of the road that intersected with the freeway. How are we looking up there? Dawson asked. Mack jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Flat across the interstate. Should be easy to traverse. Only about forty hostiles between here and there, Moss added. Really spread out, too. The corporal nodded. How'd the lot look? he asked. The privates exchanged a look concerning their superior. That good, huh? Dawson asked. Couldn't really get a good look at it, but... Moss trailed off, scratching the back of his head. Mac winced. There was some movement. Fantastic, Dawson drawled. Looks like it's gonna be a long-ass night. He turned to two soldiers taking turns curb-stomping a zombie into the ground. You boys done? he asked dryly. The soldiers straightened up and moved away, falling back into formation. Final push, gentlemen, the corporal announced. We got some light resistance on the interstate and unknown hostiles on the lot. Mac, Moss, and myself make a beeline to the front door, and once you clear out the lot, you follow. Who has the night vision? One soldier with a rifle raised his hand in the back. Dawson pointed to him. I don't care how you do it, just get on that roof and keep watching on the interstate he instructed. I don't care about stragglers, but if you see a horde, you start shooting. Yes, sir, the soldier replied, nodding. Where are my mechanics? Dawson asked. Two soldiers off to the left raised their hands. You're with me, the corporal said. Until we get those car alarms modified, you stay back. 
Once we get that done, feel free to run into whatever shit show you want to. Yes, sir, they replied in unison, nodding. Dawson appraised his team. Then let's move, he said. Hit teams, up front. Two squads of four moved to the front of the formation as the group jogged down the last stretch of road. Their blood-stained blades and bludgeons sparkled in the moonlight, ready for action. As they got onto the frontage road, the hit squads leapt into action to take out a trio of zombies. One squad of four rushed up, with the leader using his bludgeon to drive a zombie back staggering into another one. They fell to the ground, and two other soldiers made short work of their skulls. The rest of the squad moved to the interstate, several groups of creatures scattered about the pavement. The hit squads attacked in unison and formation, stabbing and bludgeoning, expertly neutralizing the threats. They reached the other side of the freeway, not concerned with the zombies that were half a mile down the road. When they got into the lot, the infestation was a lot thicker than originally anticipated. Dawson stopped short at the edge, staring at the dozens of creatures moving through the cars. Poor fuckers must have wandered in there and couldn't figure out how to get out, Mac murmured. Dawson sighed. We'll get them out real quick, he replied. Hit teams, need a diversion on the flanks. Get that center cleared out for us. The two teams of four ran down the outer edges of the lot on either side. When in position, one member from each group got up on top of a vehicle and started making a racket, jumping and yelling and banging their weapons, while the other three stood in front, waiting on the enemy to arrive. Dawson and the remainder of the squad watched as the zombies staggered off towards the hit teams. They bumped off of vehicles, knocking into each other, but one by one, they stepped up to just get smacked down by the soldiers. As the fight went on, the center of the car lot emptied out. Let's go, Dawson hissed, and led his team down the lot. They moved quickly, but quietly, staying low so the cars would provide cover. As they approached the front doors, the corporal stopped at the sight of several zombies pressed up against the glass, banging on them. He stepped up to the door and pushed lightly against it, noting that it opened inward. At the bottom, someone had put doorstops down to hold the ghouls inside. He pulled out his flashlight and shone it into the building. There were numerous show cars as well as cubicles set up, but very little in the way of zombies outside of those at the front door. Okay, Mac, Moss, Dawson said, clicking off his light and turning to the soldiers. I'm going to get those door stops. From what I can see, it's just about three that we have to worry about. They nodded and readied their blades. The corporal crouched down in front of the doors, getting a good handle on the metal door stops. He looked back to make sure they were ready, and when they nodded, he dove to the side, pulling the stops with him. The trio of zombies burst out from the door, immediately going after Dawson, who was closest to them. Mac lunged forward, plunging his blade into the side of the lead creature's head, and immediately throwing it back into the others. Moss slashed a decisive blow to the face of the other zombie, while Mac jumped over the one he killed, and booted the chest of the last one struggling to get up. He slammed his blade down into its eye with a vicious kill shot. Dawson peeled himself off of the ground, dusting himself off. Those fuckers came at me like a fat kid at a buffet, he grunted. Appreciate the quick action. If we're gonna get promotions, Max said with a smirk, it ain't gonna be that way. The corporal chuckled and led the group inside. He pointed at the soldier with the night vision rifle. Get topside, now, he instructed. Yes, sir, the soldier nodded and ran off. Rest of you fan out, we need keys. Dawson said, and keep a watch out for zombies. Those fuckers like to hide. The group spread out, looking around for keys to the lot full of vehicles. After several minutes, Moss popped up from a cubicle. I think we're in business, he called. Dawson joined him and saw the private fiddling with a large lockbox attached to the wall. When he opened it up, there were hundreds of keys, all arranged by parking lot number. Good work, Moss, the corporal said and pulled out his walkie-talkie. "'Sarge, you copy?' he asked. After a short pause, Copeland came back. "'Beginning to think you were going AWOL there, Corporal!' Dawson barked a laugh. "'And leave all the glory of completing this suicide mission to you, Sarge?' "'Never.' "'What's your status?' the sergeant asked, chuckling. Dawson watched his soldiers work. 
Dealership secured. Keys located. How long until you can get me some distractions? Copeland asked. The corporal approached one of the mechanics. Once we pop the hoods, how long to get those senses fixed? He asked. Two minutes, tops? The mechanic replied. Dawson lifted the radio to his lips. We can have a party favor making noise in ten, he said. Where do you want us to start? Get me a pair five blocks south of each bridge, Copeland replied. Those snipers are pulling their weight, so I want to pull the ones directly south of us away. The corporal nodded. Understood, he replied. From there, we'll spread them out. I'll let you know if we need to adjust the plan, the sergeant assured him. Copeland, out. Dawson clipped his radio back to his belt and whirled a hand above his head. All right, boys, he said. Get you a vehicle and let's roll. Chapter 6 Mac and Moss hopped into a bright yellow sedan rolling down the windows as the car started up. The mechanic slammed the hood down and came around to Mac on the driver's side. Okay, Mac, you're good to go, he said, leaning on the window. When you get to your destination, take the keys with you, lock the door, arm the alarm, and give the car a good shove. That should pop it off for sixty seconds. The private nodded. Is that going to give the zombies enough time to get to it? he asked. Probably not, the mechanic added, shaking his head. Which is why you're going to have to find some shelter and keep hitting the alarm until some show up. Moss rolled his eyes from the passenger seat. You got some flares, too? he drawled. Might help him really notice where we are. Dawson approached the window, crossing his arms. No, but if you don't quit your bitching, I'm going to have the mechanic here hook an alarm up to your ass and send you on a ten-mile run, he snapped. Moss's sarcasm dropped quickly as the corporal got his point across. And to confirm, Mac cut in, putting up a hand. We're five blocks south of the Surface Street Bridge. Dawson nodded. Correct, he confirmed. Put it in an intersection a block off of the interstate, so that you capture the neighborhood crowd. Follow the mechanic's instructions, then haul ass here because we got a lot more cars to spread out. Both privates replied with a firm, Yes, sir, and Mac put the car into gear, punching the gas. They turned onto the frontage road before crossing underneath the interstate and heading up the opposite side. Why not take the interstate? Moss asked, brow furrowing. Mac shook his head. Because if we run into trouble, we won't be able to hit a side road, he explained. Makes sense, his companion agreed. They drove up a few more blocks before stopping. A horde of creatures milled about on the frontage road and on the interstate just above it, slowly making their way towards the bridge. The privates listened closely and they could hear the faint sounds of gunfire in the distance. It wasn't rapid, just steady with a shot popping off every couple of seconds. Those sniper boys are lighting them up, Moss said. Mac shook his head. Problem is, they're drawing quite the crowd, he replied dryly. We're still a mile from the bridge. Moss shrugged as his partner turned down a side road, driving a couple blocks before turning north. They drove relatively slowly through the neighborhood, seeing the grass beginning to get tall. There were a few paths tracking through the yards where the foliage was stamped down. Moss wrinkled his nose as he appraised the middle-class brick houses, decaying after a month of neglect. If it wasn't for the zombies, this would make for a nice town, he said. Kind of sad to think that this scene is playing out in just about every single town in the country, Mac agreed. Moss swallowed hard. Hell, the world, he said. They shook their heads simultaneously at the thought. I can't imagine what those other countries are doing to handle this, Mac said. We have more guns than people in this country and we still got our asses kicked. Not sure a bunch of civilians armed with knives and cricket bats are faring much better. Moss sighed. So much for my European vacation. They headed up the side street, stopping in the middle of an intersection. Is this five blocks? Moss asked. Mac shrugged. Hell if I know, he replied, but I can see the dead end up ahead. Moss struggled to count the number of cross streets between them and the end of the road but the darkness made it difficult. Well, it's either four, five, or six, he said. Or in my line of thinking, Mac replied, close enough. He made the turn back towards the interstate, stopping the car in the middle of the intersection. 
The two of them checked their surroundings and got out of the vehicle, doing an additional sweep of the area. Clear, Moss said. Mac nodded. Same. His partner cocked his head. You got the keys? Mac dangled them before pocketing them. So where do you want to hide out? he asked. Further away from the interstate, the better, Moss replied. The duo looked around and spotted a two-story house, one down from a place on the corner. The front door was ajar, and Mac nodded towards it. They left the door open for us, he said. His friend scratched the back of his head. Hope that's all they left, he quipped. Mac shut the car door before fiddling around with the keys. He finally got the car locked and then paused. You ready? he asked. As much as I'm gonna be, Moss admitted. Mac took a deep breath and looked around one more time before giving the car a good shove. It didn't take much, just his light touch, to set off the alarm. A loud horn bleated, echoing through the neighborhood, causing both soldiers to wince. God damn, that's loud, Moss declared. Mac waved at him. Let's get to the house. They rushed to the two-story building, seeing some of the bushes across the street start to jiggle. They raised their assault rifles as they approached the house, and Moss took point, heading for the front door as Mac covered his rear. He pulled a flashlight, holding it above the barrel of his gun before stepping inside. As he cleared the threshold, he spotted movement coming from the back of the room at the mouth of the hallway. He immediately fired, clipping a zombie in the face. Keep your fire down, Mac hissed. We want the car to attract them, not us. Moss shook his head. Relax, as long as we got the alarm, we're... Before he could finish his sentence, the alarm kicked off. Good shit. He kept his flashlight up and quickly drew his knife, waiting in the living room. With the silence, he could finally hear footsteps on the second floor of the house. Meanwhile, Mac pulled out the keys and pressed the alarm button. Any time now, bud, Moss urged. His friend shook his head frantically. I'm hitting it, and nothing's happening, he replied. Might be too far away, Moss said, swallowing hard. Shit, Mac muttered. Hang tight. He stepped off of the front porch and started walking towards the car, hitting the alarm button the entire way. When he got to the edge of the yard, it finally went off. As it blared, he turned to retreat into the house. But there were a dozen zombies coming around the side towards him. Moss! he cried. He took off towards the house, pulling out his assault rifle. It was dark, and he was twenty yards away, but he opened fire anyway. His three round bursts tore through the zombies, hitting mostly torsos, but hitting one zombie in the head. The gunfire alerted Moss, who quickly dashed out and opened fire himself, ripping the zombies to shreds at close range. Mac tore for the door, and his partner nearly fired at him, at the last second realizing who it was and stopping just in time. "'Christ, dude! You all right?' Mac cried. His friend nodded shakily. "'Come on, let's clear this place out before the alarm stops,' he said, and rushed back inside. The duo pulled their flashlights and moved through the house quickly. Moss headed up the stairs, and as he approached the top, he spotted two zombies in the hallway, caught in a baby gate that had been wedged across it. They moaned and reached for him, and he quickly put them down with two precise shots to the head. As they slumped over the gate, the alarm outside stopped. He listened closely for the noise, but heard none. He tapped on the hardwood floor to draw any others out, but nothing came. As he descended the staircase again, Mac was just heading out the door. Clear upstairs, Moss reported. His friend nodded. Good deal, he replied. I'm going to get another blast going. We may need to hit the house next door, Moss suggested. Not that safe for you to keep going outside. Mac rolled his eyes. What's this me stuff, he drawled. You're up next. Before his partner could answer, the alarm began to blare on its own, and they shared an excited look. Mac shut the front door and they hurried over to the living room window to look outside. A few zombies hung out around the vehicle banging on the doors and windows in reaction to the noise. Eventually the alarm stopped and the duo waited with bated breath for a ghoul to hit it again. Come on, come on, Moss murmured. You know you want what's in there. A few seconds later one of the zombies bonked into the driver's side, 
setting off the alarm again. This enraged its brethren, and they all began to smack the car with vigour. More zombies emerged from the side streets, a ton of them coming from the north. What do you think? Give it fifteen minutes to make sure it's still working? Mac asked. Moss shook his head. Hell no, he replied, checking his weapons. We need to get out of here before it really draws a crowd. Then we find a house close to the dealership and hold up for fifteen minutes. The two men shared a fist bump before heading towards the back door. They peered out at the smattering of zombies marching through the backyard. As they shambled past, Mac unlocked the sliding door and gently opened it. They silently crept across the back deck and hopped over the side, landing on the soft grass. Keeping to the darkness, the duo pressed up against the house as more zombies came out of the neighbouring yards. They froze when the alarm went silent, knowing that a single noise could doom them with this kind of gathering. A few seconds later it began blaring again, keeping the attention of the nearby creatures. They took the opportunity to bolt, running through a backyard and off into the darkness towards the dealership. Chapter 7 Copeland and the rest of his crew waited at the entrance of the supercenter, keeping an eye on the zombies on the bridge and interstate. Johnson stood beside him with the night vision scope, surveying the landscape. The bridge began to clear out with the zombies moving to the north, attracted by the sniper fire. The ones on the interstate had either joined the bridge group or had started being drawn south by the sound of car alarms, creating a mostly zombie-free pocket. Johnson, how are we looking? Copeland asked. The private continued to scan as he spoke. The bulk is moving away from us, he replied. Still going to have a fight on our hands on the bridge, but I don't think it's worth waiting over. The sergeant motioned for Johnson to hand over the weapon, and he did. Copeland did a quick sweep with the night vision scope and then nodded, handing the gun back. Okay, boys, he said, turning to his team. We're gonna move and move quick. Got four on the shopping carts, rest of us are on zombie duty. Drop them quick, drop them quiet, and get ready for some heavy lifting on the bridge. We get halfway down and I want everybody focused on that front line. We're gonna have to reinforce the rear eventually, but those things are way too close for comfort. Questions? He didn't wait for an answer before continuing. Didn't think so. Now let's move. He led the group out, the eight on zombie duty carrying knives and baseball bats. Behind them were four soldiers pushing shopping carts full of supplies, like rebar, basketball, goalposts, gloves and such. The run through the parking lot was smooth with no resistance. A couple zombies on the interstate directly ahead had their attention drawn as the footsteps and shopping carts rattled on the pavement. There was nothing but a grass path keeping them apart. Copeland led the charge towards the small pack of zombies, swinging hard with the baseball bat and cratering in a skull. Several other soldiers stepped up and did the same, while a couple stayed back to help the cart pushers traverse the grass, wheels wiggling. The sergeant stood on the interstate, patting one of the concrete barriers in the centre. It was about eight feet long, solid concrete with the exception of two holes running through the top, about a foot away from each other. He scanned ahead, watching twenty zombies between them and the centre of the bridge. These won't be a problem, he said. What concerned him was the thousands of zombies another hundred yards up that were congregating between the stores. He looked over to the rest of the men who were standing and waiting for his move. Copeland started walking up the interstate at a deliberate pace, not wanting to draw attention to them. The zombies were all focused on the gunfire in the distance, so one by one, he and the rest of his men stepped up to dispatch their enemies. The group didn't take long to work their way up to the centre of the bridge, moving quickly in tandem. The closest zombie on the bridge was fifteen yards up and walking away from them. Johnson, take two men, Copeland said quietly. Set up shop twenty yards up. Any trouble, you tamp it down. The private nodded. On it, he replied, and pointed to Raymond and Schmidt. You two, on me. Copeland watched the trio head up to the zombies and take out the last few stragglers with ease, standing guard. He turned to watch the others come up with the shopping carts and stopped in front of him. The sergeant kept his voice low. These bitches are heavy, so we're going to be working in teams, he said. Four men to a barrier. 
Get up to where Johnson is and start moving them back this way. One row, all the way across. We'll worry about reinforcing it later, but right now we just need something in case they lose interest in the snipers. They got to work, throwing on work gloves and grabbing up metal posts and heavy-duty floor dollies rushing their targets. Posts went through the two slots at the top of the barriers, and then there was a quiet countdown before lifting up. As the barrier reached a foot off of the ground, another soldier rolled the metal dolly underneath. Once on wheels, the two lifters could push it along the road, straining to roll the several thousand-pound barriers. The noise they made, both straining and moving, attracted a few zombies near the back of the pack, forcing Johnson and Raymond to step up and smack them down as quietly as they could. "'Keep watch!' Johnson whispered to Raymond, who nodded. Johnson jogged back to Copeland, who was helping to unload a barrier on the side of the road. He strained, but they finally got it into place with the two men rushing back to help with the next one. "'What is it?' the sergeant asked. Moving that first barrier drew some of them back to us, Johnson explained. It's loud. The gunfire is drowning it out a bit, but as soon as that goes away, we're in trouble. And at the rate they're going, it's gonna be a while. Copeland nodded. Understood. He pulled out his walkie-talkie and dialed in before lifting it to his lips. Kowalski, update, he said. Several moments passed before the sniper came back. We're holding our own, Sarge. Pulling a decent-sized crowd from the city, but a little too far away from the interstate to do much. Satellite didn't show that many trees blocking the view. Watch your ammo situation, Copeland asked. Another moment of pause. The four of us at the target are down to about thousand, Kowalski replied. Can't speak for the others, as they don't have comms. Well, if you got three men just across the bridge, it's safe to assume they'll be at six or seven hundred based on the fire patterns, Copeland asked and there was a long silence before he growled. Kowalski, I know you aren't smart enough to be doing math in your head, so talk to me, soldier. Wade is alone on the store just up from the bridge, the private replied. The other two, well, I assume two, at least one, are several blocks up. The sergeant grimaced, knowing that once they ran out of ammo, this bridge would become very active. Well, here's hoping Wade sticks to a steady rhythm, he said because as soon as he's out, we're going to have a fight on our hands. He looked up the bridge, seeing the men struggling with the next barricade before finally getting it onto the dolly. What do you want me to do, Sarge? Kowalski asked. Copeland paused for a moment, contemplating hard before answering. If you feel like luck is on your side, then just keep doing what you're doing. He took a deep breath. If you've been paying attention with how things have been going for the past month, I'd suggest coming up with more ways to stir up some noise. He stiffened as the men continued to strain, pushing the concrete barrier with everything they had. Because unless I'm mistaken, we're gonna need it. Chapter 8 Nearly ninety minutes had passed since the barrier building had begun. The soldiers had built a line completely across the bridge, running across all four lanes. They'd even created a rectangle in the centre, stretching eight feet by eight feet, branching off the main line. Copeland strained with several other men to get the large concrete block into place. Once it was in, the men leaned over it, breathing heavy sighs of relief. That's good work, boys, Copeland huffed. Now we just got one more to build in the south. There was a chorus of light groans from the men, and the sergeant chuckled. Don't worry, that's not till later, he assured them. Now we get to do a suicide run on the other bridge. One of the soldiers threw up his hands. Finally, some good news. Another ripple of tired chuckles rose, and then Copeland took a deep breath. I need four volunteers to hold this line, he declared. And I'm not going to lie, it could get messy. As soon as our sniper friend runs out of ammo, those creatures are going to be looking for something new to focus their attention on. And it's going to be you. If those car alarms don't hold their interest, you're going to be trapped in this little square of death fighting a two-front war. But we need to defend it, because if we get too many of those things pushing on it, the line isn't going to hold. He crossed his arms. So, who's it going to be? All eight men's hands shot straight up in the air, and he shook his head, chuckling again. I'm going to assume it's because each and every one of you is dedicated to the mission, 
he said, pointing an accusing finger, and not just because you want to get out of some heavy lifting. One of the soldiers grinned. Can it be both? The group laughed again, and then Copeland pointed to the four on the left. Okay, you four win the sweepstakes, he declared, and then motioned to one on the right. I need you to get to Johnson and the others. The soldier nodded and ran off up the bridge to retrieve the guards. Remember, limit your fire until you start getting overwhelmed, Copeland reminded the team staying behind. We'll be back with the reinforcements as soon as possible. They nodded and started setting up their defences, laying bats on the ground, knives, and some leftover metal posts. Johnson, Raymond, and Schmidt approached, the former patting the barricade. Well, hell, Sarge, Johnson drawled. This is looking pretty good. He glanced at the eight-foot emergency barrier. That, however, looks like nightmare fuel. Copeland cocked his head. Good thing you're going to be with me on the other bridge, he said. Which I imagine is a whole other brand of nightmare fuel, Johnson replied. The sergeant nodded. Absolutely, Private. Wouldn't be any fun otherwise, he said. Good luck, boys, he said to the soldiers staying behind, and they saluted him. You too, Sarge, one of them said. Copeland led the group of eight back towards the supercenter, a chorus of car alarms bleating in the distance. Never thought I would say it, Johnson declared but I'm loving that car alarm sound. Copeland grinned. Hell, man, it's making me want to take a nap. A nap? Johnson raised an eyebrow. The sergeant shook his head. Didn't grow up in the best neighborhood, he explained. This was my good night song for a number of years. And I thought my mother listening to Liberace was bad, Johnson said with a laugh. Copeland joined him as they broke off of the interstate and headed back towards the shopping center. Stay frosty, he finally said. These bastards are sneaky. He led the group into the center, checking corners to make sure they were still clear. One straggler had found its way in, but with a quick whistle and point, a soldier broke off and cracked it over the head. The rest of the store was clear, much to the relief of the sergeant. They had enough fronts to fight on without dealing with backtracking. They reached the back of the store and into the back lot where the trucks were. Pile in and follow me, Copeland instructed. CB radios on channel 13. Let's move. The soldiers hopped into the three trucks, the first two starting up without a problem. Copeland got into the third one with the recharged battery, Raymond in the passenger seat. Let's hope Johnson didn't fuck this up, he muttered, and turned the key. To his relief, it sprung to life, and he quickly popped it into gear, leading the convoy out of the lot. They drove down a frontage road a few blocks to be able to cross under the interstate, and as they did, they encountered a handful of zombies meandering towards the car alarms in the distance. Copeland adjusted his trajectory, making sure to slam into the ghouls as they went by, sending them flying into the grass. The other bridge was a half a mile away, and with each passing block the dread in the sergeant's mind grew. Kowalski had said it was a packed house, but that was an hour ago so hope began to creep in. As he made the turn for the bridge, Copeland's concern was realized. There were upwards of a hundred zombies on the bridge, most of them towards the neighborhood, drawn by car alarms and not paying any attention to the constant gunfire from the snipers. Copeland studied the bridge, seeing two lanes packed with multiple large groups. He reached for the CB radio, flicking it to Channel 13. All right, boys, listen up, he said into the mouthpiece. This is going to be a bumpy ride. I'm going to take the lead and plow through as many of them as I can, get up to the top of the bridge and block it off. Johnson, you'll be up next, and I want you to wedge your truck across the road about halfway up. Schmidt, I want you ten yards behind Johnson. He took a deep breath. With any luck, we'll be able to hold off any massive horde with this setup. Also, watch your six. This is going to be loud as hell so we may have some company from the neighborhood. He waited a moment to hear the affirmative responses, and then glanced over at Raymond in the passenger seat. You ready to do this? he asked. The private offered a grim smile. If I say no, does it mean we're not going? Copeland smirked and popped the truck into gear, punching the gas. Chapter 9
The big rig jolted forward and began gaining speed. By the time Copeland hit the bridge, the truck was doing forty, which was more than fast enough to completely obliterate the first trio of zombies that it came into contact with. Undeterred, Copeland floored it, the engine squealing, drawing the attention of most of the creatures on the bridge, the next batch numbering close to two dozen. Hang on, Raymond, Copeland bellowed, and braced as the truck smacked into the dense wall of rotted flesh. Both men surged forward as they lost momentum, bodies careening in every direction, some over the side into the water below, some crunched straight back into the pavement, flattening underneath the truck. With only fifteen yards to the next group, the truck didn't have much time to gain speed, so their momentum slowed significantly when they hit the next pack. They bumped up and down as the wheels crushed bone and flesh, jostling the soldiers around. Copeland had trouble controlling the direction of the truck, darting to the left and scraping up against the concrete barrier. He quickly pulled it back to the right, barely able to regain control, heart pounding. Holy shit, we're almost swimming, the sergeant declared, laughing maniacally. Raymond stared at him, mouth agape, eyes wide as he clutched the handle above his head with white knuckles. Copeland hit the gas one more time, gaining speed for the final group at the top of the bridge. The horde was huge, well over a hundred as the noise of the zombie demolition derby had drawn them away from the snipers. We got this! We got this! Copeland yelled, and they braced as they smacked into the horde, grinding through bodies and clearing the bridge. As soon as they stopped, they were surrounded by creatures on all sides. Bloody, gooey hands slapped the side of the truck, pawing it in vain. Copeland did a three-point turn, taking his time in backing up the big rig so that it was on the surface street, and flush up against the bridge support barrier on either side of the road. How am I looking over there, bud? he asked. Raymond looked out the window, seeing only a sliver of space between the truck and the bridge. A supermodel couldn't fit through there, Sarge, he replied. We're in business, then, Copeland replied, and looked out the driver's side window facing the bridge. Half a dozen creatures stood right outside his door, moaning hungrily. Down the bridge there were thirty or so ghouls in various conditions spread out between him and the next truck, which Johnson was skillfully putting into place. Copeland grabbed his walkie-talkie, raising it to his lips. Kowalski, you copy? I'm here, Sarge, the sniper came back immediately. Was that you in the big rig at the top of the bridge? The sergeant grinned. Yes, it was. Gotta say, that was some mighty fine driving outside of scraping the paint job, Kowalski drawled. Hope you got a low deductible. Copeland chuckled. Lucky for me, I borrowed it. He heard Kowalski laugh on the other end, and even Raymond cracked a smile despite his shell-shocked face. Hey, listen, can you do me a favor? He asked. I seem to have some groupies hanging out by my door. Could you give me a hand with them? You got it, Sarge. Kowalski replied. Give me just a minute. Copeland rested the walkie-talkie in his lap and relaxed in his seat. Raymond looked out the passenger side towards town and watched easily a couple thousand zombies spread out over the shopping centre and streets. A few seconds later, several shots rang out and blood splattered up onto the driver's side window. The sergeant looked out, seeing that three of the six zombies had dropped. More shots fired off and the other three exploded, limp corpses falling to the pavement. Appreciate it, bud, Copeland said into the talkie. And, if it's not too much trouble, we're going to be making a run down the bridge, so if you want to cover us, I'm not going to complain. Consider yourself covered, Kowalski replied. The sergeant smiled. Appreciate it, he said. One more thing. How is Wade doing? He's still firing twice a minute, like clockwork the sniper replied. So unless he's found more ammo somewhere, he's got to be running low. Copeland shook his head, pursing his lips. You figured out a way to generate some noise for me? He asked. Got a couple ideas, Kowalski replied, dragging out the words. Just not real thrilled with implementing them. Copeland nodded in understanding. Hopefully it won't come to that, but if it does, I'll be ready, the sniper promised. I can see why the captain likes you, Copeland said. 
sincerity in his tone. Copeland out. He put his radio away and readied his assault rifle. You ready to do this? Raymond nodded, steeled for battle as he checked his own gun. What's the plan? Run like hell back to Johnson's truck, Copeland replied. Weapons hot, so don't hesitate to light them up and hope Kowalski continues being a kick-ass shot. Good enough for me, Raymond replied with a nod. Lead the way. Copeland opened the truck door and hopped down onto the pavement, quickly raising his weapon and firing a couple of shots towards the back of the truck. Several zombies fell limp, having been crawling out from under the back end of the vehicle. Raymond immediately drew his weapon, eyes widening, but the sergeant gently inched the barrel down with his hand. Couple of them crawling, he said, pointing. Not sure if we knocked them down or they were actually crawling. Come on. They took off running as soon as Raymond hit the ground, tearing across the bridge. They were careful to avoid the zombies on the ground, as even if their backs were broken, they could still deliver a lethal bite. Shots from the hardware store continued to go off, and still standing zombies dropped like flies in front of them as they ran. They skidded to a stop in front of a group of eight and raised their guns side by side. I got the right, Copeland said, and then opened fire. Raymond followed suit and they took down all eight with bullets to the face. The truck was forty yards away with only a few zombies standing in their way, easily dispatched with well-placed bullets. When they finally reached Johnson's truck, the private stood casually against the hood. About time you got here, Sarge, he said. Raymond's chest heaved, but Copeland didn't even look like he'd broken a sweat from their sprint. Status? the sergeant asked. Johnson motioned to the truck. Got this truck wedged in pretty good, as you can see. It stretched across both lanes, not quite touching the barrier, leaving only a sliver of space. Schmidt got his too, just at the opposite angle, so if any of those things do squeeze through, they'll have to figure out to go to the other side of the bridge in order to get through, he grinned. Frankly, I don't think they're that smart. Before Copeland could reply, several gunshots fired from the southern part of the bridge. Let's move, he said, and the trio quickly crawled under the truck, darting towards Schmidt. At the south end, five soldiers stood, taking aim and firing sporadically into the neighborhood where dozens of zombies poured out. Cease fire! Cease fire! Copeland barked. The men complied, lowering their weapons. Best we can tell, Sarge, one of those car alarms stopped going off, so they got drawn to us, Schmidt explained, motioning to the threat that was still fifty yards away. Copeland pulled out his walkie-talkie and clicked to a different channel. Dawson! What can I do for you, Sarge? The corporal replied. The sergeant kept an eye on the emerging zombies. Need more decoys up here by the surface street bridge, he instructed. Double it up this time. Next two set of drivers that get back will head that way, Dawson promised. Copeland nodded. How many decoys have you been able to deploy so far? He asked. Got thirty or so, spread out around the city, about six or eight blocks apart, Dawson replied. We're filling in some gaps now to thin them out even more. Good, Copeland said. Keep doing what you're doing, but be ready to move en masse. We might have a situation brewing on the interstate. Ten four, the corporal replied firmly. We'll be ready. Copeland put the walkie-talkie away and readied his assault rifle. Let's clear them out, he declared, and led the charge. Everyone spread out in a firing line and unloaded single shots into the horde. The bullets found their targets, dropping the corpses quickly and efficiently. As they stood to admire their handiwork, the walkie-talkie buzzed against the sergeant. Copeland, he greeted. Hey, Sarge, Kowalski, the sniper said. You might have an issue. Copeland's brow furrowed. What is it? I've been keeping an eye on your truck, Kowalski replied, and I've already seen a dozen or so of those things crawl under. They're on the bridge now and wandering toward you. The sergeant sighed. Thanks for the heads up, he said. You want me to clear them out? The sniper asked. Copeland tilted his head back and forth. If you're so inclined, he replied, we have to take them all out eventually. On it, Kowalski said. Copeland replaced his walkie-talkie and looked around at the houses on the other side of the bridge, spread out over a block. He spotted several sedans and then checked the crawl space under the truck. He turned to his team. You two, he barked, pointing at the two soldiers nearest him. Start clearing a path through these corpses. 
Rest of you start pushing those cars over here. We gotta plug this hole, he declared. Isn't going to be perfect, but when we start clearing out this part of town, it should limit surprises. Let's move. Chapter 10 Ten minutes later, Copeland watched as the final car wedged underneath the truck. It wasn't a perfect solution, as there were still a few small gaps, but it was extremely unlikely that even a handful of corpses would be able to squeeze through, no matter how much noise the soldiers made. If anything, they'd probably get stuck and add to the barricade. Johnson and Schmidt stood in the middle of the road running parallel to the river, scanning for zombies. Johnson caught one with his night vision scope and fired, dropping it. Damn, I didn't even see that one. Schmidt muttered. Johnson shrugged. Yeah, when they get into the shadows like that, they can be tough to see. Copeland's walkie-talkie vibrated, and he lifted it to his lips. Copeland. Sarge! Sarge! Kowalski cried in a panicked voice. We got problems! The sergeant's brow furrowed. Settle down, soldier, he said as calmly as he could. What is it? Wade's out of ammo, the sniper gushed, and a lot of those things are starting to move towards the bridge. Copeland grunted in displeasure. You make that noise, he instructed. I don't care what you do, just do it quick. He put the radio away and turned to his team. Our bridge boys are in trouble, so we're going to double time it. If it isn't in your way, you ignore it. He waved at them. Now, let's go. He turned and took off at a brisk pace, all seven soldiers keeping up with him. They moved swiftly along the moonlit road, the light reflecting off of the water. It was a mile run to the bridge, and as they got closer, they heard a worrisome sound in the distance. Gunfire. And lots of it. If they're firing, then it's bad out there, Copeland thought bitterly, and pushed harder, picking up more speed and pulling away from the other troops. Despite giving it their all, they just couldn't keep up with the beastly sergeant. The group finally reached the frontage road, stopping before crossing it. As the rest of the men showed up, they found Copeland staring down at the interstate away from the bridge. What? Johnson huffed. What is it, Sarge? His superior just continued to stare, letting out another displeased grunt. Johnson leaned over to see a few hundred zombies coming up the interstate towards the bridge. Raymond clustered in behind them, and his eyes widened. Not sure we have the ammo for that, he warned. We don't, Copeland confirmed but we need to slow them down. He pointed to a quartet of his team members. You four on the interstate, start picking them off, thin them out as much as you can, use every shot if you have to. They didn't even bother responding, simply running off as the gunshots intensified on the bridge. Anybody here know how to hotwire a car? Copeland asked. Raymond raised his hand. I got you, Sarge. Good, Copeland replied, and pointed back the way they'd come. Find the sturdiest one you can in the supercenter parking lot and get it ready to go. Bring it to the front. Schmidt, you cover him and make sure nothing sneaks up. Johnson, you're with me. The four of them tore across the highway, glancing over at the bridge barricade. There was a complete line of creatures on the barrier, with the four men frantically running back and forth using blunt objects to cave in heads and occasionally firing off a shot if one or two toppled over the cement barricade. Things were frantic but the soldiers appeared to be holding their own. Copeland and Johnson rushed into the supercenter, tearing in with reckless abandon. As they came around the corner past the front entryway, they encountered a trio of zombies. The sergeant didn't even break momentum, just picked up the first one, pile-driving it into the other two and sending all three to the ground past the cash registers. Johnson raised his gun and quickly fired, taking them all out in quick succession. When he looked up... He'd lost Copeland, and ran deeper into the store. Sarge, he called. Sarge! Aisle 18, Copeland called back. Johnson squealed around a corner and spotted the sergeant looking at automotive accessories. He finally picked up a handful of road flares and held them out. I'm getting duct tape and a weight, Copeland said. I need you to find the propane tank keys. Johnson started to run up to the front, hoping that they were at the customer service desk but stopped as he passed the hardware section. He checked an end cap and spotted a gigantic pair of bolt cutters, picking it up and smiling. This should do just fine, he said to himself, and ran outside, where Schmidt and Raymond were just pulling up in a giant 80s Cadillac. 
It was as big as a boat and weighed twice as much. Where the hell did you find this hoopty ride at? Johnson drawled. Smith just smiled. Amazing what's still on the road, huh? He asked. Johnson waved for him to follow him. Come on, gonna need help with the tanks. He led his partner to the tanks and peeled it open, digging out the canisters. They quickly hauled every single can they could to the car, packing it tight. Copeland nodded as he approached, holding his tools. As they finished loading the truck, he threw open the car door, climbing into the back seat, and using his knife to carve out a hole in the back seat. He punched through to the trunk, leaving a three-inch wide hole. You get this car up to the road, and when you do, open up every canister in the trunk, he instructed. Throw the road flares into the front seat, throw the weight on the gas, and let her rip. The three soldiers exchanged worried glances. That, Raymond began, that doesn't seem safe. Copeland pursed his lips. It's either this or you grab a baseball bat and start whacking zombies. Raymond shook his head, raising his palms in defeat. Copeland nodded. When you get it done, join Johnson and I on the bridge. As the boys drove off, the sergeant turned to Johnson. Come on, our boys need help. As they sprinted, the private spoke through gasps, trying to keep up. What? What about Dawson? He huffed. Already called him, Copeland replied, as if he weren't even breaking a sweat. He's on the way. They reached the interstate and ran up towards the line, and the scene was chaos. The four soldiers had been forced to retreat into the center barrier, with a couple dozen zombies completely surrounding it. On the main line, ghouls lined up shoulder to shoulder, hundreds in view and easily thousands behind them. It was a sea of moaning and flailing, the corpses trying to figure out how to traverse the obstacle in front of them to get to a fresh meal. Every so often one would flip over, stagger to its feet, and then join the others at the centre barrier. Copeland and Johnson stopped about twenty yards from the action, with not a single zombie paying them any attention. The gunfire coming from within the barrier ceased completely. How many mags you got? the sergeant asked. Johnson checked. Five fresh. Give me two, Copeland said. The private handed them over, and Copeland grabbed two of his own, putting all four in his giant hand before yelling, Bridge team! Ammo incoming! He stepped up and underhand threw the four mags. They hurtled through the air, landing perfectly in the center of the ring. We're on the flanks! Don't shoot us! He added loudly, and then he and Johnson broke to either side of the bridge. They took aim and fired at the zombies closest to the main line, making sure no soldier was in the line of fire. As they continued to shoot, several zombies turned their attention away from the trapped men and to the fresh meat. One corpse, dressed in military gear, turned and spotted Copeland, and immediately broke into a dead sprint. The sergeant aimed and fired, but the bullet tore into the creature's throat. Before he could aim again, the runner was on him. Copeland dropped his rifle and pushed against the soldier, gripping its vest and whipping it to the side. He used the momentum to shove it towards the edge of the bridge. It snarled and bit, with far more vigor than an older zombie, and Copeland avoided it as best he could, slamming it into the concrete barrier. He lashed down and grabbed its leg and flipped it over the side. As he turned around, he came face to face with four creatures that had broken ranks and closed in on him. One by one, they dropped to the ground, bullets ripping through the side of their heads. He blinked and saw Johnson standing near the middle of the road, aiming in his direction. He gave the private an approving nod and then retrieved his gun, the two of them going back to work. The trio in the center took careful aim and hit zombies at near point-blank range to conserve ammo while Copeland and Johnson delivered decisive strikes of their own. After a few minutes of intense battle, grunting and sweating and hard-beating hearts, the threat on the soldier's side of the barrier was wiped out. The three men jumped out of the barrier and one immediately began tending to the line, keeping the creatures at bay. The other two walked up, one limping and leaning on the other. "'What happened to you, soldier?' Copeland asked. The young man— no more than twenty-two, turned his leg to reveal a large bite wound on his left calf. Johnson shook his head and swallowed hard, but then spotted a zombie tumble over the barrier, so he ran off to deal with it. Copeland raised his chin. Can you stand, soldier? The young man looked at his friend and nodded that it was okay. 
He leaned on his own leg and motioned for his companion to get back to the line. When they were alone, Copeland stared straight into the young soldier's pained eyes. You know what the standing orders are, don't you, soldier? The sergeant asked. The kid nodded gravely. Yes, sir. You tell me how you want it, Copeland said gently. The soldier clenched his fists, letting out a frustrated grunt and then looking over at the line, watching his three companions fight hand to hand with the sea of creatures. If it's all the same to you, sergeant, he said, eyes blazing as he turned back to Copeland. I still have a little fight in me. He glanced down at his leg. What do you say we don't report this wound until we have the bridge under control? Copeland smiled at the young man, proud at his force of will. I think that can be arranged, soldier, he replied. Get on the line. The kid saluted. Yes, sir. He hobbled off toward the line, ready to fight. As he went, there was a large explosion on the interstate, startling everyone except for Copeland. He simply turned towards it and smiled. All right, Dawson, he said as he readied his weapon. The route is clear. Now we just need Kowalski to do his job. Chapter 11 Kowalski looked out over the interstate bridge battlefield, seeing the horde stretched across the four lanes and back hundreds of yards. Copeland had just given him the order to make noise, and now he had the pressure to draw enough zombies away from the bridge and towards the snipers safely on the roof. He ran to the front of the store, looking straight down at the doors. Zombies pressed into the opening, disappearing inside. Damn, the door is open, he muttered. Doyle shrugged. Not sure why that's a bad thing. They can't get up here, he pointed out. Yeah, but I gotta get down there, Kowalski replied. Martin blinked. Man, you're crazier than we thought, he said. Got my orders, Kowalski replied. And besides, if we don't do this, our bridge team is going to get overrun, which means this whole day was a waste. Hurley sighed. So, how do you want to do it? Kowalski looked around the immediate area. Okay, spread out, he instructed. We have to find an access hatch, something that leads down into the store, and preferably something with a ladder. The four men branched out, running around the roof, pulling on anything that looked like a doorway or hatch. Finally, after several minutes of looking, Martin yelled out from the back corner of the roof. Got something, he called. The other three soldiers dashed over to him. He shone his flashlight down a ladder that dropped ten feet onto a catwalk. Doyle, you're with me, Kowalski said. You two, get back to the front and keep shooting. Anything you can do to keep the focus on you and not me. The duo nodded and ran back to their posts. Kowalski hopped onto the ladder and climbed down with Doyle not far behind. They dropped down onto the catwalk and surveyed the sprawling network of metal walkways that spanned the entirety of the giant store. The darkness made it difficult to see exactly what they were up against. Christ, haven't these builders ever heard of ambient light? Kowalski muttered. Doyle shrugged. You think they got paid enough to care? Fair enough, his companion admitted. They raised their night vision scopes and began to scout out the top part of the store. Gotta find anything that can get us to the ground, Kowalski said. Doyle continued to search. And then what? he asked. Not a fucking clue, Kowalski replied dryly. They continued to look, and then he finally found a ladder at the far end. Bingo, let's move, he said. They crept as quietly as they could, even though they were a good fifty feet above the ground. It was always good practice to make sure the zombies below didn't know where they were. After a few minutes, they reached the ladder, which went straight down into a mechanical room in the back. Kowalski glanced over the railing down into the store, seeing several creatures shuffling around in the dark. Okay, he said quietly, leaning in. It looks like this room is closed off from the rest of the store. Bad news is, there's a shitload of zombies in there. Doyle swallowed hard. What do you want to do? he asked. Kowalski pursed his lips for a moment, thinking hard. What in here would make a shitload of noise? he murmured. Like noise that would resonate to the bridge. Power tools ain't gonna cut it, Doyle replied. What about an alarm system? Kowalski shook his head. Home alarm system? he asked. Not even sure we'd be able to activate them. 
Hell, what about a regular alarm? Doyle wondered. Like an alarm clock. Before this all went down, I saw some infomercial about the supersonic alarm clock. Claimed it was loud enough to wake up a coma patient. These stores usually carry shit like that, don't they? His companion shrugged. I don't know, but it's the best idea we got going, he replied. So we'll need those, and batteries. He paused as an idea came to him. Oh, and maybe air horns. Couldn't hurt to look, Doyle agreed. They looked out over the store, checking through their night vision scopes, seeing lots of creatures, easily in the mid-dozens. This is gonna be a bitch, Kowalski said with a sigh. Doyle cocked his head. You want me to stay up here and pick them off? Kowalski contemplated for a moment, and then nodded. Yeah, get to the center of the catwalk, he instructed. You just follow my movement, hit what you can. Also keep watch and let me know if I'm walking into something bad. How will I let you know? Doyle asked. Kowalski smirked. Just yell, he replied. They can't understand you, and if anything, it'll draw them away from me. Doyle chuckled, shaking his head at his moment of stupidity. Let's do this, he said, and extended his fist. Kowalski bumped it, and then began the climb down the ladder. He paused before he got to the bottom, using his scope to see where the door was. He had a hard time looking over the gun, so he removed it and slung his rifle over his shoulder, using the scope by itself. He moved to the door, knife in hand, and took a deep breath. Okay, you got this, he thought to himself. It's just like a Black Friday sale, only less chaotic. Before he threw open the door, he looked down and spotted a couple of large tool bags. He gently and quietly removed the tools and then slung two bags over his shoulder. He gently opened the door and inched out into the back aisle. As he moved, a moan rumbled behind the door. He darted away and then froze at the sight of a blurry figure moving towards him in the darkness. A booming shot echoed in the store, and the figure slumped to the ground. Kowalski looked through the scope, seeing the zombie dead on the ground, and then raised his hand to give Doyle a thumbs up for the assist. The shot excited the zombies in the store starting up a dull roar of moans and shuffling as they tried to get a read on where their future meal was. Kowalski moved as quietly as he could, using the scope as a guide. I know batteries are at the front of the store, he thought, so let's start there. He looked around for a moment to get his bearings and then crept towards the front. A few aisles down, moans came from just around the next corner and inched up to peek around it. There were two ghouls there, shuffling dumbly within striking distance. He motioned to Doyle, pointing to the far one, and then did a stabbing motion with the knife to show that he would be handling the closer one. A second later, his guardian angel yelled out, Okay! Kowalski counted down silently before striking. As soon as he lunged forward, a shot ripped through the far creature's head, causing the closer one to whip around towards the noise. He slammed the blade into the base of its skull, and as it dropped, he marveled at his skill in delivering a perfect strike in the dark. If I'm this good blind, no wonder I'm such a badass, he thought, chuckling to himself. He continued to the front of the store, getting to the top of the aisle and looking through his scope. There were a dozen or so zombies around the cash registers, but he scanned past them to find the battery display. With the target in sight, he checked past it to the front door, which had been completely obliterated under the sight of the horde outside. Most of the creatures were focused on the snipers on the roof, but one wrong noise inside could trigger a tsunami of death. He plotted his course so he could stay low and use the registers as cover from the zombies at the front, but that didn't help him with the dozen between him and the batteries. He looked over at the shelf next to him, seeing some small bottles of bug spray. He picked one up, feeling the weight to it as well as a metal exterior. Okay, so all I have to do is throw this close enough for the register zombies to hear, and far enough away that the mass at the front door doesn't sweep over me, he thought, and shook his head. Yeah, I totally got this. Kowalski broke from the top of the aisle, moving up towards the registers. He knelt down behind the end cap display, about ten yards away from the closest ghoul a thirty-yard dash to the batteries. This may be your last throw ever, so at least make it a good one, he urged himself, and lobbed the metal bottle towards the center of the store, arcing it high over the top of the shelving. 
A second later, it clanged on the cement floor, rattling around loudly. The zombies at the registers moaned loudly and began shuffling off in that direction. Holy shit, did that work? He shook his head in disbelief. Really? His excitement tempered when he heard moans coming from the front entrance. He peeked around the corner and his stomach sank at the sight of a dozen or so ghouls attracted by the noise. Gotta move, he thought frantically. You gotta move. He psyched himself up and moved from cover, quickly and quietly going from register to register, pausing at each end cap. The footsteps and moans got louder as he got closer to the battery display. As he took a knee at the last end cap just before it, a shot boomed from above and a corpse crumpled a few feet away. Kowalski dashed past it to the batteries. Fuck, what do these things take? He used the scope to check all the battery types, finally shaking his head and opening one of the tool bags. Fuck it, I'm taking everything. He tore the packages from the shelf, grabbing every type of standard battery he could get his hands on. Another shot boomed, and another corpse fell. This triggered moaning not just towards the door, but from the aisle he'd thrown the can down. Good enough. Kowalski didn't worry about being quiet this time, running parallel to the front of the store. His footsteps excited the zombies behind him, drawing even more into the store and in his direction. He sprinted about forty yards, holding the scope up to his eyes so he had some rough idea of where he was going. He spotted a zombie in front of him, but within seconds the head exploded, so he ducked down behind the paint-mixing stand near the front of the store. As he caught his breath, he looked through his scope at the main part of the store. There were still several zombies pursuing him, but they were a good thirty yards away and slowing as if they didn't have him in sight. He looked up at the aisle headers. Hardware, door fixtures, cleaning, he read. Fuck, where are these things? He kept scanning until he stopped on one sign that read, Home Goods. Figuring that was his best chance, he checked, and then sighed when he realized that it was the aisle where the can landed. Well, bad luck is at least a form of luck, he thought, so the fates haven't completely abandoned you. He looked up at Doyle, who he hoped was watching him. He motioned to the aisle he needed, that was now filled with zombies. A second later, Doyle yelled, are you insane? Kowalski simply looked up at him, giving a big smile and a thumbs up. He imagined his companion sighing and shaking his head. Hang on, I got an idea, Doyle called back. There was a moment of silence and then bullets started flying. In addition to the boom of the gun going off, there were metal pings coming from the front of the store, and then a high-pitched hissing sound. Kowalski's eyes widened when he realized Doyle was firing at the propane tanks. He had a moment of panic, though he told himself that without a significant spark, those things weren't going to detonate. Still, it's a risky move, he thought. But it couldn't be helped. What was done was done. At least the zombies from the aisle shambled towards the hissing sound, and he waited for several to go by before moving. As they staggered, one of the ghouls got its sleeve caught on a display, and no matter how much it shifted around, it couldn't break free. Okay, fates, I get it. I have bad luck, Kowalski thought bitterly. Can you lay off now? He moved up quickly and quietly, hugging the top of the aisle, and darting across the openings in case something else was waiting for him. As he approached his target, another shot went off and the trapped zombie slumped on the display. Unfortunately, the dead weight pulled down the metal structure, crashing loudly on the floor. Kowalski froze and then raised his scope, watching several of the zombies that had left turn around and head towards the sound. Nice shooting, Tex, he thought. Sorry, I got you, Doyle called, and shots rang out at a rapid pace. The returning zombies began to fall like flies, and Kowalski didn't wait, trusting his companion to have his back. Unconcerned with his noise due to the gunfire, he tore forward, sweeping the aisle to make sure it was empty, and then studied the shelves. Halfway down, he looked around frantically, hoping the alarm clocks would jump out at him. He finally spotted something promising and picked a box. Supersonic alarm clock, he read to himself. Wakes the dead or your money back. He shook his head. So that's what causes the apocalypse. At least they get to keep their money. He stuffed six boxes into the tool bag and closed it up. Got them, he called between gunshots, 
headed back. Kowalski ran down the aisle back towards the maintenance room, awkwardly looking through the scope as he went. Big crowd ahead, Doyle yelled. Get to the wall! Kowalski reached the center aisle and looked down towards the target wall, where several zombies came up from the back of the store. He put his head down and ran, trusting that his partner would do his job. Blood splattered on his arm as he ran past a zombie, but he didn't stop. He made it to the side wall, staring at the maintenance room. Several zombies came towards it from the other side, so he took off at a sprint. He pumped his legs as hard as he could, the chorus of moans rising and echoing. He pushed his body beyond what he'd ever pushed it before, beating the zombies by a couple of steps, and threw the door open, rushing inside. As he tried to pull it closed behind him, a set of rotted hands grabbed him from the back and pulled. Kowalski strained, keeping the door as shut as he could, putting his boot against the doorframe. Any time, Doyle! he yelled. Another shot went off and the hands fell from the door, allowing Kowalski to slam it shut. Holy fucking balls, man, he muttered to himself as he made his way to the ladder. I'm never doing that again. He climbed up, starting at the top when Doyle squatted there, waiting for him. You good, man? he asked. Kowalski huffed. Yeah, I'm good, he replied, just hoping I get a promotion from this. Does rank really matter at this point? Doyle asked with a light laugh. His companion smirked and shook his head. Yeah, it means I would be able to delegate this to you while I sat up here all comfy and shooting, he drawled. Doyle chuckled and helped him up, and they made their way back to the roof. Once they emerged from the hatch, Kowalski let out a loud whistle so that the others knew they were back. Martin and Hurley gave a quick wave before going back to shooting. Doyle and Kowalski walked to the back of the store, where the latter dumped out the tool bags. They quickly ripped open the boxes and battery packages, assembling them. Kowalski fiddled with the controls on one of the finished ones. All right, here goes nothing, he said, and then hit the alarm button. Immediately, both men covered their ears as the 115 decibel alarm nearly blew out their eardrums. He switched it off. Fucking hell, that's loud. If this doesn't do it, I have no idea what will, Doyle replied, and they scrambled to slam batteries into the rest of the clocks. They brought all six to the air conditioner unit near the back of the store and aimed them towards the bridge, nodding while covering their ears as best they could before hitting all the alarm buttons. The sound was deafening. Blasting through the air in alternating beats, they backed away from the clocks and then went to the far end of the back of the store. Come on, motherfuckers. You know you want to know what this is, Kowalski thought, and both men raised their scopes, relieved to see that some of the creatures from the bridge at the back started to wander towards them. Hell yeah! Kowalski cried, raising a fist. Sonic boom for the win! The men exchanged a high five as they kept watch, surveying more and more creatures coming their way. Kowalski pulled out his walkie-talkie, lifting it to his lips. Hey, Sarge, come in, he said. A few seconds later, Copeland replied, Not sure what that is, soldier, but we can hear it down here pretty good. The sniper grinned. Sonic alarms, he said loudly. And if you can hear it there, then you can only imagine what it sounds like up here. Question is, the sergeant countered, are they working? Kowalski nodded. They're starting to, he said. Already have several dozen peeling off and coming our way. Only a matter of time until the others join. Damn fine work, Kowalski, Copeland said. Damn fine work. The sniper straightened his shoulders. Thank you, sir. Copeland out. The duo of snipers stood and watched as more and more creatures wandered off the bridge, heading towards the sonic distraction. Chapter 12 the alarms had been blaring for a half an hour, and the zombie horde at the barricade became smaller and smaller. The sun began to peek up from behind the horizon, illuminating the horrific carnage on the bridge. There was a pile of bodies stretched across the interstate, easily three deep and piled three and four high in some spots, with the soldiers out of reach and the alarms blaring in the distance. The stragglers on the bridge had lost all interest and wandered away. Sergeant Copeland stood proud, nodding in approval of what his men had been able to accomplish. As he admired the scene, 
Dawson approached. Hell of a night, huh, Sarge? the corporal asked. Understatement, soldier, Copeland replied with a sigh. Understatement. Dawson crossed his arms. So, what's next? he asked. I'm going to keep a skeleton crew here to do some reinforcements on this barricade, the sergeant explained. It barely held a couple thousand, so no way in hell it's holding back a hundred thousand. I want you to take the rest of the men and start clearing the neighborhoods. Those car alarm batteries aren't going to last forever, so we need to strike while we can. Any word on reinforcements or a resupply? Dawson asked. Copeland shook his head. No, but I'm supposed to talk to the captain in an hour or so. Good deal, the corporal replied. If you need me, I'll be on calm. Be safe, Dawson, Copeland said, and watched him walk away and begin to bark out orders for men to follow him. Most of the group left, except for five standing at the barricade. Copeland took a deep breath and approached the young soldier who'd been bitten, standing guard as strong as ever. He sighed, showing a brief moment of reluctance as he knew it was time to do what he didn't want to have to do. Rest of you take five, the sergeant said. Get some chow from the super center. The four men shared glances, looking at him and then the young soldier. They nodded at him, silently paying their respects and thanking him for his service that night. As they cleared out, the kid stood firm. Is it time, sir? he asked. It is, soldier, Copeland replied. You've done a damn fine job. I couldn't ask for a braver soldier to be under my command. The kid nodded, but remained stoic. Thank you, sir. That means a lot to me. Do you have any requests? Copeland asked. Just one, sir, the young man said politely. I would like to go out a warrior. The sergeant shook his head. You don't have to worry about that, son. I do, sir, the kid replied. If you do what you need to do right now, it won't feel like I'm a warrior. It will feel like I'm being put down like an old dog. Copeland nodded thoughtfully. What would you like, then? The young soldier set down his guns and ammo and pulled his knife. With your permission, sir, he began, I would like to hop that barrier and go slaughter as many of those things as I can before they overwhelm me, using my knife only, so that none of the ammunition goes to waste. Even if there is enough to me to reanimate, I won't be a runner. Copeland pursed his lips. You know that goes against direct orders, he said. I won't tell if you don't, the soldier replied. The sergeant cracked a smile, impressed at the young man's quip. He contemplated for another moment, weighing his options, and then nodded. Happy hunting, soldier, he finally said and saluted the kid. The young man saluted him back and then hopped the barricade, hobbling towards the zombie horde. Copeland watched, eyes shining as he stabbed a couple of stragglers in the back of the head before moving up towards the bulk. The sergeant turned around and walked away from the barricade back towards the supercenter for a bite to eat. The End Up next, the next phase of the operation. Corporal Herrera joins a team airdropping onto Mercer Island to create a diversion zone in Seattle Part 2.